Live from the Moss Eisley Cantina, it's Derailed Trains of Thought. All right, well, welcome. It's been a while. Um, it has been a while. We had to take a break just because life kind of got in the way. Life's been kind of crazy lately. Yeah. Um, and this is episode 30. Yeah, we made it. We made it yet again to another milestone. Yay. Yay. Next swap We're is still alive. a prime number. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and with us today is uh, our friend and contributor, Brian Churchill. Hello. Welcome. I'm glad you uh, managed to make it with us today to this hive of scum and villainy. I if anyone shoots, uh, yeah, Greedo Gre shoots first. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to mention was Gre where Greedo shoots, shoots first. Exactly. <laughs> so they say. So I, they I've, say. I've heard differently. <laughs> and where Jabba shows up in places where he wasn't before. But that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Yes, in a, in a strange new format. More Jabba is... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're, you're not used to this uh, whole ad-libbing I've, I've, I've been drinking too much already. <laughs> I, well, I actually, before we came here, I had to go get some Aunt Brew's blue milk stuff. But <laughs> oh, yeah. That stuff never looked healthy. No, it did not. Yeah, the, that blender did not yeah. look appetizing Tatooine at all. Tatooine Kool-Aid, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then before that, went to one of the Tuscan Raider uh, cookouts. <laughs> Do not. Bad barbecue. Bad barbecue. The Jawas make better food, I've The heard. Jawas do make better food. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on, Nick. So, um, actually, speaking of uh, Jawas and Duskin Raiders and whatever, today's, uh, well, first we'll be doing Story School. I almost led into it without... Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, speaking of Jawas and Tusken Raiders and um, other aliens, um, well, today's uh, topic is supporting characters. Which is totally what I think of when I think of aliens and weird creatures <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, well, there's a supporting character for Star Wars, but you could have supporting characters like... Um, well, basically every story. Yeah, well, I know. I was going to try to mention an actual supporting character. Oh, uh, okay. Like, such uh, as? Such as Thompson & Thompson from Tintin. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just saw Tintin, so. To, to be technical, let's, let's, is there, I was wondering about this, is there a defining difference between a supporting character and, say, an ensemble? Like, say, Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. has got sort of an, yeah. uh, I mean, you've got Frodo as the main character, kind of, but, you know, Aragorn, Gandalf... Are they main characters, or are they supporting characters? Or is it more of just an ensemble? Yeah, so does it really apply? Yeah, I, I I, mean, I suppose you could argue either way, depending on your purpose. I would say they were more ensemble. They're, they have equal weight in the main plot. I think supporting characters are usually B-plot sort of mm -hmm. stuff, or, or foils, you know. They're more of a support for the main one than an actual yeah. having a long arc of yeah, their they're, Yeah, they're, they're, you okay. know, you could take them out, and you could still have the plot, but it wouldn't be as fun. Okay. <laughs> right. And then like like verse like supporting characters versus like a company of, you know, many people that all contribute to the story is kind of hard to make that distinction. Like maybe Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, you maybe have more of an ensemble mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. thing going on, and then yet with other things you can try to sort it out and say, Well, that's genuinely a supporting character. Yeah. If you get nominated for Best Supporting Actor or Actress, then you're a supporting character. <laughs> well, even that, <laughs> even that is debatable sometimes. Because, I mean, like in the True Grit, Haley Steinfeld was nominated for Best Supporting Actress, and people were like, what? She's a main character. So it depends They probably on... just wanted to get her a award. Or I, a I suppose. She, she wasn't a famous enough to be to get a lead nominee right off the bat, I guess. So I'm going to start off with this. This is my observation of supporting characters. It holds for mostly musicals, but it also goes into other things, is that the main characters in a musical are boring. <laughs> they have to hold the plot. Yeah. And the supporting characters is where all the fun happens. Well, they're usually the more the comic relief. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, because you have to have the love story hang on, ser you know, semi-serious people. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, but that just the plot's too simple then. So you have to throw in these goofballs. I, I recently went to see the Broadway version of uh, Beauty and the Beast, which uh -huh. is a great example of supporting characters everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got all, you got Cogsworth and Lumiere and LeFou and all these people who are there basically just to make it a, a fun movie. Because the plot by itself 
as presented, is relatively straightforward. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess it's like the 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 Muppets. (laughs) I got to bring in a Muppet reference here. Um, Everyone loves Kermit, but if you want to ask someone who your favorite Muppet is, some I mean, some people will still say Kermit, but it's usually with a degree of hesitation and be like, well. Kermit's kind of the obvious answer, but I really love the the Swedish chef, and he's like that yeah. random guy. New Zealand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing the boomerang fish, or... The hecklers. Or... Yeah, the so hecklers, yeah. It's, they love being able to say, oh, I love those those guys off on the sidelines. It's kind of like the supporting character is like uh, spices in a, in a dish. It's like okay. it gives it all the flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you didn't have the supporting character, yeah, it'd just be a very... It could be much more generic hero story a lot of times. I mean, the heroes aren't... They're not necessarily boring, but they have to be more the straight and narrow traditionally. I mean, there's way, there's all kinds of ways around that. But. Yeah, that's true. So what are some roles that the supporting character... We talked a bit about the comic relief is one. Comic relief is a big one for the more lighthearted... You know, your romantic comedy, there's always, like, the best friend who's, you know... Or, like, we were just talking about, before we started recording, um, Singing in the Rain, which I just saw. The main character's friend, the piano player, who is just hilarious. But he's, in some ways, he's more fun, because every time he's on the screen, you know, he's just gonna make a witty remark and do something crazy, like dance on the floor, like, while he's lying on the floor, or what. Mm-hmm. Well, since we're here at the cantina, you know, you got C-3PO and R2-D2, who are half comedic and half... Right, I mean, their characters are used for, for specific plot. purposes and, yeah. like... Yeah. Not out of convenience, but more as as an addition and as part of the group that goes along in various places. And they, they, they have a purpose R2, to serve that. R2 is vital to the first movie. I mean, he's Very. he's got the star plans. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, R2 is the one who actually saves the main characters. As opposed to if they just had the plans stored on, like, a chip or something. <laughs> and they just carried it around with them. And it's like, oh, well, you have the plans now. Who has them? And that wouldn't be nearly as good as... Is recorded in the droid, you see. <laughs> yes, <laughs> with a lot of personality. Mm-hmm. And I think that the the supporting characters give a sense of they expand the world too. And the droids are a perfect example of that. But in most, it wouldn't have to be a fantastical world. It just expands your your points of view. Yeah, um, and besides just having yeah the different perspectives, sometimes they also are key in helping get exposition across. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of Watson's whole job. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He follows Sherlock around and and sees what he does. I mean, sometimes Holmes used him in plans. I mean, Watson was uh, a crack shot, so he used that sometimes. But generally speaking... Or just used him like in uh, Hound of the Baskervilles to kind of, you know... Yeah, be the foil and and not really tell tell everyone else what he was actually doing. (laughs) Right, and so the supporting character ends up being something that... You get to bounce things off of. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times it's sounding board. It's yeah. Doctor I mean, Watson is like a perfect sounding board. The main character comes to revelations through talking with him, like because otherwise the detective doesn't have anyone to say, well, you know, this is the reason why this works and how I'm figuring this stuff out. Well, you always it's all much easier, especially in well, you can get away with it le- more often. Books having just one character in a scene, but normally in any sort of play or movie, you want two people because you need someone to bounce stuff off to so have dialogue. J. Mark Zizinski, you know, he always said that he, two people in a room, he could write forever. But mm. multiple people in a room gets more confusing. Well, of course, you have to have someone to monologue to. Well, you have to have someone to monologue to. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, what about somebody, like, we mentioned Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. What about Star Trek? Isn't, like, isn't Spock one of the greatest sounding boards ever? <laughs> That's true. I mean, he, everybody bounces things off of him. Well, we he, always want to know how he reacts to things. And well, I mean, a lot of him is reacting, I would, I would say, almost more than a, acting. A raised eyebrow sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And you just All need things. him to say something like, fascinating, or <laughs> something like that. And, and uh, Well, Kirk would be nowhere without his supporting characters. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they do most of the work, really. He's just there. Kirk's just there for the fight scenes. It would almost be also <laughs> sort of women. like... Um, yeah, and the women. Sort of like Picard and data yeah, that's maybe true. as well mm-hmm. it's, at least in the, especially in the film versions of things yeah because some uh, of them in the in the show versions supporting characters can kind of change depending on what episode you're in right? yeah if an Very. episode is focused on its main or like lost you could say there's a horde of of supporting characters or a horde of main characters or a horde of main mm-hmm. characters <laughs> i mean like hurley yeah. seems like a supporting character until eventually he becomes actually really important mm-hmm. so and i guess even star trek you've sort of got a trifecta of like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy kind of all seem like the three main characters. Yeah, and then Spock, because he's Vulcan, he adds that different perspective instead of just the two of them going off of their human emotions. And instead, we get to we get to see how Spock treats something, and sometimes 
like with uh, like Star Trek Two, like he learns about the whole Genesis thing and how yeah. you know everybody's like, well, this could be a really terrible weapon and everything, and then. Spock is like, well, you know, there's a matter of fact about everything, and and McCoy is like, oh my gosh, how can you say that? <laughs> Are you, oh, you're, McCoy. you know, he was like, you green blooded, inhuman, <laughs> and all he does is raise his eyebrow. <laughs> so because as we're fighting, supporting characters is very uh, kind of subjective. Yeah, well, yeah, in TV especially, it, it, like we said, it really depends a lot on the episode. Sometimes you trade hats for, okay, it's this episode I'm the supporting character, this episode you are. But no, most times, unless you're writing a very complicated plot, you have one main plot. Sure. And then everyone else is kind of filling in gaps. Mm-hmm. And, and they play a really good role that way. I'll just throw in here, you know, we, we've talked about the Squire on here before. Yeah. There's like, you know, 13 supporting characters. But it's very clear that Obed is the main person. And everyone else just kind of gives their, I mean, they all they all kind of have different parts of the world they reveal to him, I guess. I mean, it's kind of set up like a mystery. I hadn't really thought of it that I, way. I, I just now thought of that. I wasn't my plan. I mean, uh-huh. it's also an adventure, but I mean, some mm-hmm. of the, they each reveal different parts of the world. You got your thief, and then you have your... yeah. He, you know, right. your different aspects of, the, you know, here's your magician, here's your, the two girls who are involved in all kinds of feelings. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. We've talked about how some they're helping fill in the world, but also sometimes they're the ones who help push the protagonist into situations. Yes. Sometimes by getting themselves in trouble. Like they have to go, res- you have to go rescue. Or you're Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, oh, Hamlet, no, we're your friend, remember? <laughs> really, we really are. <laughs> I always supporting characters always remind me of foils because when we did it in Canberra, mm-hmm. it was always um, which one was Hamlet's foil? Ford and Bros? Uh, no, the one that he like his no 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 uh, Laertes. Laertes, yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. he doesn't kind of change, you know. He's the, the static character. He's the static a, character. Yeah. He's changing. And sometimes mm-hmm. you have your supporting characters who kind of... We learned the same thing in Huckleberry Finn, that Tom Sawyer is there at the beginning and at the end, and he hasn't really changed, and mm-hmm. Huck's done all this stuff in the meantime. Yeah, okay. Um, that these supporting characters sometimes are not just sounding boards, but ways for the author to say, look how much our main character has changed. You bring mm-hmm. the supporting character back in who... Because sometimes supporting characters tend to be a little more one note than your main character. Mm-hmm. Often. That they tend to have some sort of quirk or personality thing yeah. that defines them, and they don't necessarily change. Mm-hmm. Coming from like my experience with Agatha Christie, that would be a good one too. In that there's like Hercule Poirot, he has Captain Hastings, and then like Miss Marple. Miss Marple had Mister Stringer, where it was that static character that you got to go through with everyone and. Sometimes that character is something that you can, like, the viewer can relate to as a guide, but sometimes, like, in Christie's case, it's like a genuine sidekick thing going on. And sometimes in films, though, it's good to have a character that can be very related to the audience, so that, and that's the way that you learn about the world of the story, mm-hmm. and is through, like, a static character who acts as, like, a guide through things and doesn't necessarily change, but instead reacts to things as the viewer kind of would. Yeah. Which they do. I, you had mentioned Hurley at Lost. He had always kind of played the role of acting like the audience would act. Like, <laughs> wait a second. We didn't know anything about that. You yeah. know, because... And then Referencing you, Back to the Future when they're time traveling. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and that's not the only example. Just, you know, we have to bring it up occasionally here on the podcast. But, <laughs> you know, I think that's a good point. That sporting characters often are the channel to ask those basic questions. Yeah, because if, if you don't address the questions that the audience has, then they're going to feel frustrated. Like, it, Or it could even feel like a plot hole if you don't address something that's like, well, why don't you just do this and I'll take care of it? Well, we can't because... And the supporting character usually is the one who brings that up. Mm-hmm. Right, and then if you're if you're looking at a story where things happen and it's like, well, just because. And it's <laughs> like, well, you don't want to have just because is the answer for why things happen. You have to kind Unless, of bring that logical something in. Unless you're Lewis Carroll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you're off the rails, yeah, <laughs> completely. For pretty much. Now, we've been talking about supporting characters a lot in as they support helping the main character. Sometimes I think they're not always, they can be antagonistic to the main characters. Like, going back to Greedo, in a sense. <laughs> he's, he's very much a minor villain, sort of a supporting character. But, I mean, really, his appearance in the first Star Wars doesn't really have a lot much relevance to the main plot, you know, the whole Death Star thing. It's really more just to kind of establish Han Solo. 
is this bounty hunter, tough guy that people are out to get him. So that gives him an excuse to, to leave toward the end of the movie. Right, is to develop other characters more fully and give them a kind of depth. Mm-hmm. And so we learn about like what Han's kind of value system is, and like then we are able to flesh out his character more. Mm-hmm. So, and sometimes you've got other antagonistic ones like. Well, I mean, they're not the main one, but they just show up to cause problems. Yeah. It often is to establish how tough a hero is at the beginning, <laughs> that he just kind of mops the floor of them, and then they don't, you know, see him again in the movie. Boba Fett, maybe, uh, might be perhaps. a possible one. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. He, he's such the the strong, silent type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was more of like an outlier. Yeah. Like, as far as... He provides us grab hold of. People have kind of elevated him to a major villain status, but really in the movies he is pretty minor. Yeah, pretty. Yeah. He just kind of shows up and does stuff. I think this. I I think a creator though, from all the things we're talking about, needs one of the best things to do for a supporting character is make him or her memorable in some way. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, sometimes those are the characters people remember or love best are all the. This random guy who showed up just was a goofball. Or, mm-hmm. you know, part, sometimes he was a comic relief, but I think because they're supporting, because they're not necessarily carrying the way of the plot, you can give them some sort of flair, and I think that's something you want to do, give them some sort of shorthand Yeah, that makes it easy to... Right. I know a lot of my characters, Strand Fred, minor characters have some sort of shorthand that kind of identifies them, you know, well, like the way you, they talk or the way yeah. they... Yeah, I was going to say, there's that one guy with a goofy accent. Yeah, exactly, so. in, in The Squire, yeah. And I think and I think you can have a lot of fun doing that. If you haven't ordered the trailer trilogy, you know, people like uh <laughs> like Adassa okay, or yeah. uh, or or the narrators. Mhm. They're just there. They don't need to be there for the actual plot. Mm. And Jimmy in the third movie has sort of a, a like a little mini arc. I yeah. think having your having a little mini arc for your supporting characters, I think, is a neat thing too. Because I mean, the one note thing is is very useful. But sometimes if they have a little like their own little story, mm. then that adds another layer. To Especially it. if it's a novel, you need, they need to have some sort of yeah. movement normally. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have more time. Dickens yeah. is pretty good at that. Dickens, mm-hmm. is, that's actually a really good, he's great at supporting characters. <laughs> I remember from Hard Times, the teacher, who <laughs> was all about, you know, there was no imagination yeah. allowed. Yep. And he his character was really well developed in his, how he reacted to things and mm-hmm. how he just laid it out about this kind of world that, that Dickens creates. In, or Bounderby. Bounderby the great Oh, character. yeah. He is. He's always blustering and saying how awesome he built himself up for uh. his bootstraps. And... <laughs> I remember David Copperfield. I don't remember as much mm. from that book as I would like, but there was one character who was really well known for writing these really lengthy letters, like elaborate, and to the point where, like, when he's he gets this big scene where he gets to do this denouma where he denounces someone, he actually does it by reading a letter out loud. And... <laughs> oh, Tale of Two Cities, Jerry Cruncher is one of the oh. all, most awesome supporting characters of all time. He, he's always beating his wife and t- telling her to stop flopping down. She's praying. Stop flopping down. And he gets, he's a, he's a grave digger. He has this whole scene where he's imagining this coffin's following him. And <laughs> I mean, if you want to make good characters, read some Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> Or uh, the what's the what's his name from Oliver Twist, the guy that teaches Oliver? Oh, Dodger. Dodger, mm, the artful yeah. Dodger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, he has a, that really cool Billy Billy Zane song. No, wait, that's Oliver and Company. Never mind. <laughs> 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 but yeah, Dickens knew how to do his supporting characters. Mm. Yeah, I and mean, then some some authors have a lot of characters that are of equal weight, which you can't do quite supporting. You got. Dostoevsky does it. I, I have to throw him here. Yeah, I, he does was, that sometimes. I, was, I had a feeling he was coming up. I, I thought, well, since we're talking about epic novels, I might as well pull him in here. And there's some support, but so many people, he plays the themes off so many different characters that it's really... It's, it, that made me more of an ensemble it, It's more of, of a, yeah. Well, he, he does it differently. What about Les Mis? Would you say that pro- mm. is similar? See, the, pro- the book's so massive... That everyone at some point is a main character. Okay. <laughs> and it seems like almost, doesn't everybody change practically? Yeah, you know, I mean. A lot it, of people it, it change just, over time. When you get the, like, with Victor Hugo and Dostoevsky uh-huh. and probably Tolstoy, mm-hmm. everyone is moving all the time. Mm-hmm. And that it's such an epic thing that supporting character is not quite the right term for any of them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, and those, a lot of those novels are serialized, too, so they're, that's sort of like your ongoing TV show where, oh, that's true. where yeah. everyone gets their chance to be in the limelight. 
And, so, and sometimes the entire purpose of the novel is to kind of move the theme through all ten characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so the more classic or uh, heavy novels tend to have maybe use the supporting character less than the more uh, than the more visual media or mm-hmm. or the more genre media. Okay. I mean, genre stories seem to have a lot more supporting characters because it's more focused, I guess. Yeah, well, and you want to have more people to help explain where you're at in this, yeah. in this strange yeah. new world. Yeah, yeah. The, the stranger the world, the more you want to try to flesh it out and, and have it explained by how characters act and how they react to things. And, and especially, like, the whole purpose of, like, having a guide, especially, too, is, yeah, is to, exactly. is to have, bring us through. You have a mentor and, who and, dies at some mm-hmm, point. and. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they're often there just to kind of help highlight the danger of the situation. That's where you get your red shirts, basically. <laughs> your red shirts, exactly. Yeah. Then you have your supporting characters. They're just to die at the beginning of the episode, or, yeah. or you know, you're the monster of the week or the criminal of the mm-hmm. week, sort of. Well, thing. like I was thinking, Doctor Who. You've got your your characters who uh, they just got died at the outset, and then there's ones who actually from the world who wind up working with the Doctor, so you actually care about the danger that's at the you know the place that they're at. Because you, you kind of know the Doctor and his companion are usually going to get through okay. Yeah. But you've got to have some people... Unless it's some, in the finale. Some, yeah, unless it's, a, <laughs> unless it's the end of the season. But you got to have some natives that uh, you grow to become concerned for. Yeah, and TV's supporting act. I mean, every episode, anything episodic, you always have your supporting actors who are or characters who are like, I'm here for this episode, yeah. so you, you care. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's some sort of, you know... Very strange episode where it's just your two main characters stuck somewhere, you know. Mm-hmm. Which occasionally you see those, and they're they're neat, but they're yeah. rare. Yeah. Another supporting character I sort of thought of the way that it was like it sort of gets integrated into the story later would be Star Trek Voyager with the Seven of Nine character. Oh yeah. Because it hmm. like you start out where you know you literally take somebody out of the Borg yeah. and then re you know sort of reanimate the human aspects of it. And you end up creating a character that lasts like many episodes, and actually becomes quite popular. Yes, and yeah, it becomes an important character even uh, mm-hmm. over time. And yeah, very and very popular. Yes. Well, that's always kind of interesting as a writer to take a, a supporting character who might be more kind of just a single note sort of idea, and then draw a personality out mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And that's always really cool when you've got a character that kind of takes on a life of its own because the writer really enjoys doing it, and the fans really enjoy it. And sometimes you can say that for a recurring character, like uh, if we're talking Star Trek, Q mm-hmm. is a great example of a character that they probably, I don't know how much they meant to keep him on, but he just kind of kept reappearing because yeah. people really liked him. Mm-hmm. So so we've talked about a lot of supporting character yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I, I think they add a ton. I mean, doing a good one adds a ton to your story. I mean, everyone loves Watson. I mean, you don't yeah. read Sherlock Holmes for Watson, but it'd be much less without him. Yeah, very true. I and mean, I think that's the way short supporting character should work. If, it, if Sherlock Holmes was just narrating his own adventures, he'd come across <laughs> as even more of a <laughs> arrogant, <laughs> sort of, more, more arrogant than he already does. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more like, hey, look at my friend; he's really cool. Or like, I mean, and the the BBC version shows that perfect. That yeah. you know, I mean, it was just him. You almost couldn't identify it very well. It still be fun, but it's nice to have. Um, Watson kind of, they're just like rolling his eyes like, really? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, pretty much. So. Pretty much. So, yeah, I like I like the term you used earlier. There are good spice to your story, and the more memorable, the better. Yeah, because you could make a course with just a hero, but it's not as good. <laughs> not, not the same thing. No, kind of bland. Okay. All right. Awesome. So that was Story School, and we'll go into our soundtrack. I'll start with our soundtrack today. Um, it is from a remix of Mega Man X5. It's called Put Ya Gun. <laughs> Put Ya Guns On. You're not Homestar Runner. I'm not Homestar Runner. Put Ya Guns On. <laughs> <laughs> um, remix by Diggy Dis. It's uh, they released a, a remix album of all Mega Man X music, and this is a remix of a uh, Zero, a, st- a Zero stage, which would be uh, one of Mega Man's supporting characters, Zero. Now Mega Man X, that's like a series of Mega Man games that came after the regular. Yeah, it's ones. like a hundred years after or something mm-hmm. like that. Oh, okay. I played the first one. Okay. Um, yeah, I got to the first two, I think. But yeah, it, it, it ended up uh, being like a series. It, kind it, of thing. It, yeah. There's eight of them at least, I uh-huh. think. Um, oh, okay. 
Our friend Nathan would know a lot more about it than I do. Obviously. But yes. um, Zero was a supporting character who grew into a more and more major... I think he's a playable, main playable character in some of the games. But mm. this is a remix of one of his stages. Um, it's very, uh, to quote DJ Pretzel, goodness the funk. So it is quite entertaining. Enjoy. Welcome back. Very groovy song. That was a very, a very nice song. And we'll go to our next uh, section, Cinema Selections with Brian Churchill. Um, today we are decided to, well, we didn't really, Brian suggested we do 
Lost Hor- the her Lost Horizon. Uh, Lost Horizon. Lost Horizon, which we uh, actually managed to fit in while you guys were listening to the soundtrack. Yes, the entire two-hour <laughs> movie we squeeze. Time must work differently here in Moss Eisley. I think it does. Yeah. Yeah, but it was really nice of them to screen it for us. You know, the band stopped playing and, and they, they did the soundtrack for us. Yeah, yeah. They, well, that's true. <laughs> they, were, they were in the other room while we were watching the movie. We only had to break up a few fist fights in the meantime, but we got through it. But, yeah, somebody's arm got chopped off by a yeah, lightsaber, uh, and that was ugly. Uh, yeah, was <laughs> but, um, yeah, Lost Horizons. Very interesting movie. Brian, why don't you uh, give us a little info about it? It's Lost Horizon from 1937. It is based on a novel of the same name, and... It was uh, directed by Frank Capra, who mostly does um, sort of uh, comedy, kind of light, lighter things. More Americana uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I'd seen like three Frank Capra movies before this one, including It's a Wonderful Life, of course, um, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. But after none, this one. Oh, that came yeah. after. But, but yeah, none of the ones I'd seen before were quite like this one. No, it's really um, an original movie. Uh, He was chosen to direct it by the studio, and he, uh, after reading it through and everything, he was really fascinated by by what was there. So the Mm -hmm. the basic premise is Robert Conway, who's a A diplomat diplomat in China. Yeah, British diplomat in China. They're escaping from some sort of insurrection in China with a couple other um, random Westerners. Random Westerners, and. Play ends up being kind of hijacked. Very Temple of Doom. Very Temple of Doom kind of hijacking, and they end up in Shangri La, and then all the kind of responses and interesting ideas related to yeah, a nice movie with uh, the supporting characters to talk about because there's some really good actors in this. Yeah, there are um, some of the supporting characters. One is a paleontologist, and he is played by Ever- the actor Ever- Edward Everett Horton. He is a character actor who really excelled. In the kind of nervous Nelly kind of personality. Well, how could I know that a wall was going to break out right over my head? Right over my head? Oh, my word. I-, I tell you, those Chinese were pouncing on me from every direction. I had to get into these ridiculous clothes in order to escape. Where were you hiding? Hiding? Oh, no, no, no. Hunting. I was in the interior hunting fossils. He was frequently in, in Frank Capra's movies in, in one place or another. Some of the stuff that he did included, uh, he actually did some voices for some of the Rocky and Bullwinkle characters. I thought I heard Mr. Peabody. (laughs) Yes. And he was one of those people who, he was also in a lot of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies as well, but he was known as as the guy who could say, oh dear, and you you would really think it was like the world ending. And and that was his his talent. And he's one of the people who's uh, taken... Uh, when everybody else is kidnapped on the plane, and he excels in in that kind of personality, and he really is able to show it through, and we're able to see kind of his reactions to all the really different, strange, in his in his terms, mysterious kind of things that are happening in Shangri La. Mr. Conway, I don't like this place. It's too mysterious. And eventually, his character does change in respect to the experience that he has there. I think pretty much all the characters change as they react. Um, another one uh, that's really big is Thomas Mitchell. He was in Gone with the Wind, It's a Wonderful Life, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He was also a Frank Capra actor. He was also used by John Ford sometimes. And he was a really well-known, versatile character actor. He plays um, Barney, who was originally a plumber and then a head of his own um, company, as we find out later. He also reacts very interestingly to it in, in that he, at one point, gets it, sort of. Yeah. He understands what's going on. Um, yeah, he's pretty satisfied with the whole experience pretty much from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Probably because he's escaping something on his own himself. <laughs> this is true. Another actor that we have is uh, John Howard, who he plays the brother. He plays uh, George Conway, uh, who's the brother of Robert Conway. And he ends up as one of those guys who wants to be in the thick of it. He wants to be in reality as he sees it. And instead, he is pretty much disturbed by everything there he's one of those people who he can't have like an absence of struggle like without struggle he pretty much can find almost no purpose and he is really taken away by Shangri-La and he doesn't like it even and he ends up melding sort of with one of the other personalities who's there in Shangri-La Maria who uh, also sort of views Shangri-La as a prison and there's that dichotomy that's presented in the movie between People who who definitely would want to stay in a place like Shangri-La and people who can't stand it. And there's that sort of struggle there. Yeah, that brother is a very interesting character from the audience's perspective. 
Because, I mean, I think we're all kind of trained to be distrustful of utopias. Because, I mean, at least personally, by my beliefs, I don't think a utopia is possible on Earth. And especially American society, we're very cynical about that sort of thing. But at the same time, the brother is not really a very likable character throughout most of the movie. (laughs) I mean, he is just so intense on getting out of there and not paying any attention at all to the culture that they're surrounded by that he's really quite a irritating character. And yet, mm-hmm. at the same time, like, if I was actually, like, you know, looking at their philosophy and stuff, it'd be like, yeah, this guy, the brother is actually more rational than the rest of what's going on here. George. George. George, you're behaving like a child. You haven't opened your mouth for two weeks. Well, I don't see that there's anything to say. And it was interesting because the whole idea of the Shangri-La that they have this kind of peaceful society. Very brotherly love. Very brotherly love, and they, they want to kind of spread it throughout the rest of the earth eventually. And and then you have the brother who basically won't take it. Yeah. Which kind of throws a wrench into their whole system in some ways. <laughs> like it doesn't work as it doesn't, well as they think. It does, well, yeah, it doesn't work. I mean, it works with people who, are, who buy into it. Yeah, yeah. Which uh. is kind of the, which really is kind of the whole flaw with their systems. It works, yeah, brotherly love is great if everyone would do that, but I don't think that's really part of human nature. And talk about no, Brian, it pretty much defies human nature <laughs> in, in many different ways. And Brian, yeah. you were saying that you know he, he kind of can't live in a world without struggle. It's interesting that after the first after the first act, which is what like 20, 30 minutes, mm-hmm. most of the movie is a plot without about about giving up struggle, which is a different way of going about there's a really lot. yeah there's really not much conflict going on i mean when they first get to shangri-la there's kind of this oh what is going on the, the, mm-hmm. are they keeping us prisoner here but for the most part you come to accept that they are who they say they are and then yeah there's it's not really like it's a conflict that's pushing it forward it's more like just a passage of time and like a like a like an internal acceptance I should have told you it is quite common here to live to a very ripe old age, uh, climate, uh, diet, uh, mountain water, you might say. But we like to believe it is the absence of struggle in the way we live. In your countries, on the other hand, how often do you hear the expression, he worried himself to death, or this thing or that killed him? Oh, very often. And very true. Your lives are therefore, as a rule, shorter, not so much by natural death as by... Indirect suicide. Mm-hmm. And also, all, kind of, the audience are kind of drawn further and further. And I mean, they spent a long time kind of building this society up. Yeah, they really uh, did. And, and it kind of works that way. Yeah, and the head of the, of the society, uh, Father Pearl. Who looks a lot uh, like Yoda. Yeah, he does. There's some Yoda <laughs> thing going on there. Especially with like, even the, that even the cane doing, that he has. He had the cane, uh, he had the fuzzy hair on the mm-hmm, head. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> Very. I didn't think of it that way, but I, I can see well, it. We're, we're, start, we're here in Mos Eisley, so my... Mm, it's on the mind. Yeah. You know, uh, you guys were talking about the Horton guy, and suddenly I'm thinking C-3PO. Mm-hmm. Like, I did. Oh, oh dear. Yes. <laughs> yes, I thought C-3PO as well. Anyway. <laughs> Um, interestingly, that wasn't like C-3PO wasn't even invented to be that kind of character initially because he used to like they initially thought that he was going to talk like a used car salesman, <laughs> which that's definitely not him. No, um, no, no, no. but it, instead, I, I like Ever- Barney. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I like Ever- uh, Edward Everett Horton yeah, a, a whole character. lot in this movie. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is the passage of time and and how the characters react to it and how they are able to perceive their new reality. For instance, like Barney and um, Lovett, who's played by Horton. Barney and Lovett, at first they're they're quite skeptical, and then over the passage of time, they are like, well, maybe we can do things here that that we did on Earth too, but only here. You know, we don't have to worry about so many other things in our lives. I like how he said as as we did on Earth, because <laughs> mm-hmm. when you go to Shang your lot, it does really feel like yeah. you're in some other place. Mm-hmm. It really is. It's very far removed. But yeah, the supporting characters really all bring other, because your main character, it, he believes it instantly. Yeah, I mean Conway is, accepts it because Con, yeah, I mean Conway's, Conway's a perfect character in a way because yeah. of the way that he's always mired in these foreign affairs and all of these things where as as, as the place they're escaping uh, China it was either it was, the conflict that was going on there was either some kind of internal struggle or possibly the Japanese invasion because they were in Manchuria by this time and so it was possibly I would say Japan maybe but. Uh, he is constantly weighted down by diplomacy and a kind of helplessness. And most people don't know it, but he himself thinks that his life almost has no meaning, even though 
he's going to be the foreign secretary of, of Britain. It's interesting because he's very, he's a very passive hero. I mm-hmm. mean, when he's against Shang Long, he's basically just like, I belong here. I'm not yeah. worried. But he's the first one to give up, basically. Yeah, he's or he or he's the very first one who gets it like immediately. Yeah, in that he's in that. Some of the characters, even like Chang and, and some of the other ones, tell him, well, isn't this what you dreamed yeah. about? Yeah. Maybe, you know, this is what you did want. And he, of course, obviously, I think when he right when he sees it, he's familiar to it. Yeah. And he, he gets about how the society works. Well, he is a very extreme idealist. And very. like you get that sense on the plane, like right when they're escaping, that he had all these great ideas, but reality kind of came crashing down. And he would really love to work outside of it, but his... He has such a strong moral center, but he can't help but work within the system, even though he really despises it. You know, it's interesting that that scene at the beginning that kind of establishes his character. He mentions, like, I would do all that, but I won't be. I'll just go along. It's interesting because at the end, he has another choice whether he's going to do what he, what he thinks he should or just go along. And he kind of hasn't changed. Yeah, well, that's true. Mm. He, in this, he's sort of a static character, actually. Yeah, I mean, almost, almost everyone else changes. Mm-hmm. I mean, he doesn't change until the last his bro- five minutes. His brother doesn't really until, like, well, maybe the very end. Well, that's true, yeah. Like, when he really. But I don't, but see, I always figured the brother was more of a foil against him. Yeah. Than his brother's like, okay, here's the opposite of. Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Yeah, the two brothers are, like, very, very opposite uh, characters. And everyone else is kind of in somewhere along the spectrum. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and what do you make of of the of the fact that this movie was made in thirty six, thirty seven, only it, two years before the war? I, know, I thought that was very interesting because um, there's for if you haven't seen it, uh, which you probably haven't. Uh, there's a whole concept that Shangri La is built to hold all the treasures of, like intellectual treasures and cultural treasures. Yeah, of, like books, art, music of the world, yeah. so that when when humans basically kill each other, that then they it can be like a place of re- rebirth mm. and this was written before world war ii well before yeah full scale of it mm-hmm. and which is very interesting because the the guru guy said the high lama actually says at some point it came to me in a vision long long ago i saw all the nations strengthening not in wisdom but in the vulgar passions and the will to destroy I saw the machine power multiplying until a single weaponed man might match a whole army. I foresaw a time when man, exulting in the technique of murder, would rage so hotly over the world that every book, every treasure would be doomed to destruction. Well, what does that make us think of? I mean, well, yeah, this is only, uh, I believe, eight years before the atom bomb was a reality. You know, and it's interesting because it felt like it could have been written after the atom bomb. It really like yeah. not like one of those 50, 60 mm-hmm. movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was rather prescient about how it, yeah. it, it viewed the trend of, of weaponization you know and, and when mechanized the book war. Was written? Um, I know it would have been up. before um, that even, maybe yeah, not much before. Um, that. This might have actually been possibly written after the facts of World War One. Probably, there, a lot yeah. of World, like, mm-hmm. World War Two is yeah. probably one of the most predictable wars, <laughs> uh, well. very much so. And some of the movie, especially with the speech that the High Lama gives, do you notice how some of it was put into stills because there was only the audio that was available? Oh, yeah, why yeah. do you suppose that was? You better explain why only audio was available. You said yeah, this movie the, was originally like six hours long. Well, it was six hours long before it was recut. And then uh, after it was recut and redone, it was about 137 minutes. Uh, so about an hour and se- two hours, 17 minutes. And then over time, it was about, what did it say, 20 plus minutes were, were cut out over time as the movie was shown. So we are left with the audio was found and, and pieced together, and uh, yet some of the film was, was not survivable. And so instead there were, put, there were stills that were put in. But there were some stills that were interspersed during uh, the High Lama's speech. So in other words, they had to kind of put that audio back together again. Why do you suppose the audio was cut out in the first place? Look at the world today. Is there anything more pitiful? What madness there is, what blindness, what unintelligent leadership. A scurrying mass of bewildered humanity crashing headlong against each other, propelled by an orgy of 
greed and brutality. And I think part of that was cut because, I mean, parts of it were cut out because of the film's pacifist message. And that was cut out as a result of a bias against that pacifist message. Mm. Full disclosure, I read something about that. <laughs> but it's it makes complete sense, it make sense as to it? what cut mm. as to what parts were cut out. And, and so be, because I believe possibly during the war when the this war was too, shown, yeah. then we they might you know they quote unquote <laughs> might not have wanted the audience to hear that pacifist of a message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though the director Capra probably very much agreed with those sentiments. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, so, some of the other cuts I can kind of imagine, I think it was not uncommon for theaters at the time to trim things mm -hmm. to, because movie theaters like having that narrow two hour thing so they can fit in more screenings uh -huh. of things. Especially since I don't know how successful was this thing. If it wasn't one of the most successful films, they would have had no qualms of cutting it on their mm. own. Oh yeah, I mean, maybe some of the stuff that gets caught even as or cut even as successful as some movies are. But uh, <laughs> this was uh, a relatively successful film. It's routinely shown, from what from what I understood. Okay. Uh, not only because it's a Cabra film, but because of of the size of the production and how monumental the the film's actual production was. Because they did put a lot of money into it, oh, like that, the sets. That's uh, very clear. A lot, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of pr high production quality in it, and uh, I think because some people wanted that certain parts of the message to be cut out, parts of that were gone, and then some other things were just for expediency. But yeah. uh, but the speech itself in the middle there, that's definitely yeah, that uh, makes sense. Yeah, and. I think I think the message is still really profound, the way that that the High Lama discusses these kinds of issues, because he viewed what did he say? He had a vision, a really graphic vision of of what would happen in like worldwide conflict and all the destructiveness and all the bad qualities of humanity all come together, and he viewed Shangri La as a place that would be a shelter essentially from all of these really evil forces. I mean, the way it's set up is really around a philosophy. It's really a philosophic movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, more than a... It's got uh, the, then a con then a conflict oriented movie like most movies mm -hmm. are. It's really it's even billed as an adventure flick. I mean, it's an adventure film, but yeah. it, it's a very different kind uh, of yeah. adventure film. And I think possibly people didn't really know, you know this didn't really fit into all you know a neat category I, I, could, I could feel i could feel you know seeing that at the beginning that was based on the book you could feel with the sort of book it would have been mm -hmm. and you can kind of you can see how it could have influenced things that came after it i mean we talked about indiana jones and, and star wars um echoes that we've yeah. seen like, but funnily enough one movie that it went like when they were arriving at shangri-la and they were kind of explaining their whole philosophy one movie that it made me think of and you're gonna laugh when i say this but one movie it made me think of was this island earth mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean it's bizarre but yeah you've got this alien race that they go they take these humans there it's like hey we think you're smart we're gonna go show you our civilization mm -hmm. and stuff it, they go in a very different direction with it, <laughs> and much cheese in much cheesier. But you can mm -hmm. kind of see that sort of that type of adventure movie where you go to see meet a, a strange new civilization sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, it, this is a really good point. And remember, they sought out Conway. That's the interesting part. Another interesting part is Jacob that Jacob called him to the island. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Sandra. What she read his books, yep, read and his she book. and she said she found she found a man with not very much life in him and, and purpose in him and she knew that basically that Shangri-La was the answer and mm -hmm. then but they actually went out and, and found him and mm -hmm. and brought him there and it's probably because the High Lama thought that he was the type of personality to be in charge of it which is really amazing. I just have to also mention here that I won't spoil it, but I I really enjoyed the the direction it took at the very end which was different than I was mm -hmm. threw a little wrench into it yeah, and I really wasn't expecting a wrench at that point. It was a little unclear how it was going to end exactly. Yeah. like you said, there wasn't really any conflict in the middle of the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have to agree that that, that scene with, between Ronald Coleman's character and the, his brother really set up the climax very nicely. Yeah, yeah. and and you had to you had to answer that kind of conflict finally somehow between the two brothers and their points of view it's are uh, you going to be man of science or man of faith yeah know? exactly you know are you man or a muppet yeah and <laughs> the brother the brother kind of thought i kind of thought that he was like this almost sort of uh, he reminds me of uh, uh johnny storm is that that's the name from fantastic four i don't know sounds right yeah it reminds me of him from the early 
comic. And this is sort of like part. modern view of things, and it's kind of come on, uh, reality is this. Yeah, you don't we, want, we must move on we, and progress. Always yeah, progress. Uh-huh. Yeah. There, there, there's a part of this. It's parts that don't work, but parts that give me influ- influence of stuff like uh, out of the silent planet, sort of just bits okay, and pieces, yeah. or or you know, some of it has the overlap. Since Shangri La has this half utopian heaven feel mm-hmm. of some of the ways C.S. Lewis would talk about people leaving or not accepting right great, just little hints of that great divorce and the end of uh, last battle and stuff like that that's mm-hmm. a very interesting yeah comparison I was thinking of it more in terms of like it's very this is a very humanist vision of people well, are basically well, good, and it, is, and it but... is yeah I don't agree with that part of it but it's interesting at least the question of whether you accept utopia I right. guess mm-hmm. In what mm-hmm. format it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reminds um, me of some of that Swiss Lewis, how he presents it sometimes. Yeah, this film is really good source material. You can tell this is source material for like other filmmakers and, and other story writers. Uh, well, I was saying, was I on the podcast where I was talking about the third Mummy movie? It felt like bits of... I think you mentioned it right before. Yeah. Okay. It, it, uh, yeah, there are bits of Lucas and Spielberg. and It just, yeah, yeah all kinds... I mean, it didn't have Yeti like the Mummy did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe like there's a connection to even Terry Gilliam's films, and because in oh, the so way that <laughs> yeah, in the way that Terry Gilliam like his movies are all about like the escape from reality, mm-hmm. and and I think this really kind of encapsulate like historically, if you look at American history, world history, like a lot of this sort of encapsulates the desire to. I mean, I think a lot of people in the interwar period were pretty well not all that happy with like modernity and the kind mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. future that it seemed to bring like there's like that really kind of ugly side of I guess it really works to, and I, I hadn't thought of this but that it opens with conflict I mean it opens with international problems mm-hmm. yeah that's true yeah, and, and how he Conway talks about how, you know, oh, we saved 90 white people from this conflict. You know, forget about the 10,000 people who got annihilated <laughs> in this conflict, the 10,000 natives. Yeah. And he full well knows the kind of the kind of despair about about what modernity had brought yeah. people up to that point. That was something I thought was interesting that he used that term white people as opposed to Americans or British yeah. or like Westerners, yeah. Yeah. Although he did use a the Chang, I believe, uses the term Westerners, where where he's like, you know, it's funny how you Westerners always view things like this. Yeah. Yeah. Some very. uh, It it feels like it could be a product of the time, but it also feels outside of that. It Mm -hmm. has a certain timelessness to it. Yes, it does. And and, yeah, and just wrap up one more time. In connection with our supporting characters, they really are. We've talked various ways you can use them, but this one's really to analyze different views of this points of view of the. The idea the author is going for. That's mm-hmm. true. Yeah, the supporting characters all they they give us all a different viewpoint and, uh, about how they view like the superiority or not superiority of, of this utopian society. And it's interesting. The brothers obviously are on the far extremes, and then you have the um, the other two guys are kind of like mini versions of the brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, they're I like see that. they're they're not as far as part, and they're not as they're mm. they're like mirrors in some ways. They're yeah. foils, I guess. The, each pair of them is foil. And then there's this, there's this lady in there that. Could have had a plot line and didn't. So I don't yeah, know she probably happened. did. Like at, at some point, I mean, a lot of that when stuff is cut, like I, I, I buy automatic automatically. I just blame the studio. <laughs> it is just you know the studio gets to come in and decides to say, oh well, that's interesting and that's not. And it's like, well, okay, but and the but the character of um the one the character that we were talking about is um, Gloria because she she starts out at the movie where she's very ill and they given her six months to live. And we can assume. I think she we can pretty very, well like, assume. Like giving up on living, sort yeah. of idea. Yeah, and she, she, yeah, she didn't feel good at all. And then we, I think it's safe to assume that she got her, yeah, and, her condition is mm, probably very well, very much reversed the by the environment. Island worked. Yeah. <laughs> do you? And this may be a faulty interpretation, but do you, did you get the impression that she might have been a prostitute at some point? I, I did. I thought that was a possibility. Maybe. I, I had that once or twice. Had that. Cause that signal, but I, I never got much of it. I was just w- curious because she seemed very bitter at the beginning, and she mm-hmm. talked about like the others about them being more. Yeah, high. She, and her, yeah, her dress was, was all yeah. kind of torn up. I, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. And you know, and then it was a big deal when she didn't make makeup on. Mm-hmm. She, she, I think one thing was that she had like a very like a life that was really full of struggle, and even more than she thought anybody else in that plane could even you know dare to compete it, with. It would have right. been interesting. And so that yeah, probably a very tough life. 
if, and so if, if that mm, was the case, that might have been another thing that might they may have cut it out because uh, they yeah. thought it was a little too inappropriate, know, quote yeah. unquote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but I could see her if they had fully realized her plot. I think it would have expanded even more kind of all the angles mm-hmm. they were going for. And I bet yeah. the book has it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and she ends up it's being. Interesting uh, to read some of these old books that you probably can't even find hardly. It would be oh, that you can find those. It might be it might be an interesting read actually because of of the way that that sometimes movies aren't able to fully encapsulate something. Probably when they it may have been when they got the original six hour cut of this, <laughs> the studio was like, "Well, no, this is way ahead of its time, <laughs> but we're not going to bother doing that." You know, like yeah. And instead, they wanted to, to cut it down to something a lot more manageable because not more marketable. Even though yeah, even though at the it is probably interesting because they very well might have had that six hour cut as their original vision. Mm-hmm. Which was kind of interesting. Uh, like, I can't imagine somebody like Capra going about that gigantic of a project. It must have been very, very big for him. Yeah. Because uh, this is definitely not, it happened one night. <laughs> it's very different. All right, well, we well, should probably wrap this up. So do you have a summary yet? Oh, um, I would say that Lost Horizon is a very different film, especially for its time. It's really given a lot to, I would say, the pre-war mentality and maybe even the mentality of the entire interwar period in which humanity had a lot of questions about how can we make things more perfect and how would we go about doing it? And at the same time, lamenting all of the bad qualities of humanity that were very, very present at the time. It's a surreal trip. And, uh, but I don't think you'll be too sorry that you took it. No. Great adventure. And that was, uh, our Cinema Selections, Brian Churchill. And finally, I guess we'll wrap up with some contact info. Of course. All right, uh, our website. If you found this on iTunes, is uh, derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. You can always email us at derailedtrains at gmail.com. Which reminds um, me, I need to check that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We've been kind of out of the loop for about a month now. And I think podcasting is going to kind of continue to be on a more of a monthly basis for us. Or sorry if that pains you, but we've got a number of projects in development and, and it's kind of hard to to manage all of them at once and maintain the schedule we used to. Now, if we start getting just thousands of emails, we might have to change our minds. <laughs> so, yes, you're welcome to try to to try changes. We would be quite surprised. Yes. We'll close out here with one more soundtrack for my soundtrack from a new choice. game. Yes, I'm going back <laughs> to one of my old one of my there's, old standbys. There's so much good music from these games. Well, it's true. And I mean, for supporting characters, I wanted to have something with a character that I knew. So naturally, I went to Final Fantasy VI. Uh, this is a remix of uh, Setzer's theme. Well, plus Searching for Friends, I guess, is part of this remix too. But that's basically his theme. In yeah, the new world, or pretty, ruined world. Yeah, pretty much. But. The name of this remix is A Day in the Life of a Gambler. So yeah, again, very setzer. Uh, this is remixed by JJT. Does that stand for something? I think it's Jig and John T or something like that. Okay. I think he used to call himself that, I think. But this is a very nice uh, piano. It's pretty much all piano in this, isn't it? Piano yeah, very jazzy piano. Yeah, jazzy piano. It reminds me a lot of like old school Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers. <laughs> just that, that kind of just soft, hey, life is going to be good sort of feel to it. So, yep. close your eyes, slip away to Shangri-La, and uh, enjoy A Day in the Life of a Gambler. Thanks again for listening. And this has been... Oh, uh, I was going to say, Day in the Life Gambler. Sorry I did not win the $500 million uh, lottery. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but thanks again for listening to Dear Old Trains of Thoughts. This has been Nick. This has been Tim. And this has been Brian. Adios. Shangri-La. <laughs> Goodbye. Good <laughs> fortune with you.
a trap.